the first time. But yeah. we are speaking the same thing with all the MVP batches. And that is what uh, is becoming more of a challenge. I am happy to do it across a number of my institutions, which I don't want to leave in the lurch. But this is now becoming a big challenge. How do I make it more interesting for my own years? Uh, is becoming more, uh, more of a challenge. Yes, fam, the same uh, content is to be shared with participants, batches one after another. But one way of making your uh, your interaction with participants uh, very exciting is that in the next uh, residential FIP, I will very humbly request you to come to Aligarh and then we can have you here, host you and our FIP participants can. I'm so sorry for the NEP orientation programs. We don't have any sanction for residential uh, mode. These are all uh, uh, the online mode. Uh, but then, of course, I will be very happy to have you over, ma'am. I'll call you and we will discuss your availability and your travel plans. And it will be wonderful, wonderful if for our FIP you can come over. In fact, uh, the fact that it was online allowed me a lot of flexibility to take it up so yes. easily. When it becomes yes. residential, I have to really see a lot of other things. But nevertheless, Outdoors. let's see. Yeah, let's let's see how Answer. it can be worked out. Yeah, yeah. Answer yeah, we would love to have you over in okay. <laughs> okay. So it's over so to sure. you, Dr. Shakir. Okay. You Thank and you your man. evidence source okay. person and your enthusiastic participants. Thank you so okay. much. And all the best. My, my best okay, wishes for this session. Oh, okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, participants, uh, 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 can you see this, participants? Yes. Yes, sir. I would I would request two participants to answer. What is this? Sorry. What is this? National education new education policy. New education policy. How many pages are there? How many pages are there? 156. About 100 pages. Okay. Okay. Ma'am will clear all these things. Okay. So I think uh, you have heard about NEP. You are uh, attending NEP programs. And there is a lady uh, who was behind this policy. And that lady is before us as our resource person, Dr. Shakila T. Shamsu, ma'am who was working as OSD to NEP 2020 at that time. Ma'am has started working on this NEP uh, in 2014 and till date, till date she is working on that because at that time she was preparing, uh, of course, with, a, with her team. And now she is helping uh, the institutions in implementing the NEP policy. Uh, Ma'am is the, as I have already mentioned, former officer on a special duty OSD to national education policy 2020 uh, when she was working in the department of higher education ministry of education government of india uh, ma'am has also worked as secretary erstwhile committee to draft nep policy ma'am has also worked as honorable advisor special education policies center for public policy research kochi kerala ma'am has the experience experience of around four decades in the teaching and learning and administration Ma'am has also worked as nodal officer of Government of India scheme of national mission on teachers and teaching uh, for LEAP and ARPIT programs. Ma'am has also worked as joint advisor education in planning commission of India. Ma'am has published a good number of papers in various international and national journals of repute. And ma'am has uh, been very active in uh, preparing 11th and 12th plan, you know, that in Government of India's 11th and 12th plan and a very busy person in teaching and learning and uh, other academic activities, but always ready to contribute when it comes to contribution, contributing for NEP implementation and all, because it is very close to her heart because she has worked on it. I am very much thankful to Dr. Faiza Basi, Madam, our director, ma'am, for bringing her because she will be giving you first-hand experience because she was there when this policy was made and still she is uh, helping the institution in its implementation as far as madam's academic qualification are concerned ma'am is uh, MA in political science as a gold medalist and ma'am has also completed her phd in education and uh, has worked in university of mumbai university and indira gandhi national or national open university before joining of course uh, mhrd we are very much very much thankful ma'am you have given us time you are very busy but when it comes to nep as ma'am was saying you with 
or any NEP program is incomplete without you, ma'am. So thank you, ma'am, for joining us and giving us time. Participants, now ma'am will uh, deliver this session. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Professor Shakir, Dr. Shakir, and uh, I was happy to have uh, Dr. Faiza Abbasi also there. And greetings to all the participants. Uh, it's a short one and a half hour session. And the topic assigned to me is academic leadership and governance. Uh, but I, as uh, Shakir had lift, pointed out a book, and uh, some of you said it is uh, new education policy, some others said it's national education policy, some said 150 pages, 100 pages. Pallavi wrote in the chat box that it is 66 pages, which is the absolutely correct uh, picture. But I think that, uh, of course, the book itself gives it away because it, the title reads as National Education Policy 2020. But I would still feel that if some of you have not read it, uh, you must read it in its entirety, not just confine yourself to the higher education part. And I would even urge you all, if you can read through the committee's report, which is a voluminous 484 page document. And in that, if you can get out time to spare time to read through it as educators, it is very, very important for you to understand it. Let us be very clear. This is not a work of fiction. And it is not something that anybody else other than educators would be very keen on reading. And if we as educators are not reading this document, I think it's a great disservice to ourselves and to the profession to which we have committed ourselves to be as faculty. So let me not try and uh, sort of be very soft on you that if you have not read it, please read through it. It's four years down the line since that document was officially approved by the union cabinet on 29th of July, 2020. And we are speaking here in 2024. Y'all are teachers, we all are teachers. And though I have been a part of that policy making exercise, thanks to that opportunity, it is it is indigent on us that we read through the document. But I'll also try and clarify to you that when the policy was being formulated, we called it the new education policy. And people tend to use NEP with two, the acronym in two ways, or the abbreviation in two ways. Some say it is a new education policy, and some say it is national education policy. Now that the policy has been approved, wherever you are referring to NEP in 2020, it is the national education policy and not the new education policy. Why we did that as new education policy is there was already an existing policy of 1986 modified in 1992. So in the ministry, when we initiated the exercise of formulating the policy to distinguish it from the previous policy, that exercise of formulation, we called it as formulating the new education policy. There was no year specified in that because we didn't know when that policy would get fructified or finally approved. So it was only called the new education policy. Once the policy became approved, we call it as the national education policy, and that is 2020, the year it stands approved. Now, the topic on hand over here, and that this is day three, and I believe this may not necessarily be your first faculty development program on NEP sensitization. I would be really happy in a couple of minutes, let's just say up to four, five or so, or four, ten, if a few of you could give give me some thoughts in terms of your own observations or maybe suggestions or maybe challenges that you face in implementing the national education policy. I would re really ask if Shakir can coordinate that or even otherwise, if you raise your hand and you can unmute yourself and give me some observations that you have as faculty, because I understand NEP is under implementation, you all are a part of that process. And let us not confine ourselves to academic leadership. You can ask on any aspect or touch upon any aspect of the night. It can be holistic and multidisciplinary education, or it can be the regulation part of it, or it can be part relating to the use of technology, or research and innovation, or open and distance learning. But I would like to hear a couple of you. Let's keep that time. It's 3.57 now, up to 4.10, if one or two or three of you can share your thoughts i would be very happy to hear you out uh, 
participants you can raise your hand or uh, you can open your mic and you can start talking and sharing your experience pallavi ma'am good afternoon sir good afternoon dr shakila good afternoon would you like to say any observations ma'am i think uh, nep 2020 um first of all let me give you some background and from uh, mumbai i am a faculty at uh, nmims i teach uh, at school of economics and i have uh, joined last year only and since then every faculty meeting we update ourselves with nep 2020 policy in fact in fact the new batch which is coming in 24 25 which we will have in july so uh, our institute is already uh, we have already molded to nep norms and requirements for nat purpose also which means now the graduation batch will go for uh, which will be for four years so we have already updated and we are we are in the process of uh, adopting nep uh, rules and regulations and requirements in whatever way possible and i think it will give it's a good document in as much as i have read and understood Uh, because it will give both the faculty and the students the flexibility in acquiring different sorts of knowledge and bringing them together in different domains also and it is it is good also because it leaves some room for the students to get, uh, to do some skill development and also internship and work simultaneously with graduation which is something which is a flexibility which was not there before nep 2020 so this is seen as a big change um, as as much as i know of nep and i'm looking forward for your session ma'am uh, thank you thank you thank you pallavi that was very positive and you really touched upon the core aspect that nep talks about flexibility and multiple options uh, which was hitherto not possible under a very rigid and structured system Uh, under which we all had undergone education and which now the students and faculty do get a benefit and happy to see that you are from my own alma mater because i am a product of mithibai college so it adds to a certain sense of gratification to hear someone much much younger to me than when i was a student at that time yeah anybody else please yes dr ram kumar please go ahead Dr. Ramma, you unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. I unmuted me. Yeah. Very good afternoon. Yes. I am in EP case. Which we have to focus on the best is that in fact we were working on that. That vocational course is skill based course. And and now recent we have also done one more change. That we are emphasizing value added courses. So that the actual NEP goal is that we are emphasizing value added courses. So that the actual NEP goal आने वाली जनरेशन को विद इमर्जिंग ट्रेंड्स ऑफ द जॉब अपॉर्चुनिटीज हम उनको मार्केट वैल्यूज के रेशियो में या एजुकेशनल रेशियो में उनको प्रिपेयर कर सके इसलिए नीति हम लोग को बेस्ट लगी और इसको हम लोग इम्प्लीमेंट किए थ्रू प्रॉपर चैनल आल्सो वी वर इम्प्लीमेंटेड इन बी एस देन आफ्टर ई सी देन आफ्टर ए सी नाउ इट्स फुल्ली फंक्शनल बट अभी अकेडमिक क्रेडिट बैंक का जो इशूज अभी उसको रिजॉल्व नहीं कर पाए डिजी लॉकर में भी थोड़े इशूज आ रहे हैं एन एडी रजिस्ट्रेशन में भी थोड़े इशूज है But by the passing of time, I hopefully we will cover it. Oh, yeah. This where was where do you teach, Dr. Ram Kumar, and uh, what is your uh, discipline? My name. I am working here as assistant professor in Sri Venkateshwara University. It is in Uttar Pradesh, in the west part of Uttar Pradesh. Okay. Uh, district okay. name is Gajrola. Oh, Amroha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Location is Gajrola. Okay. So you also yes. feel that uh, the benefits of NEP accrues yes. from the fact that we have embedded skills as a part of it. including the value added courses and there are operational problems particularly for academic bank of credit this is something that yes. will take time it is only as we go along we resolve it ultimately it's a 
uh, it's a platform where you are actually mm. putting in a lot of data that comes in from about nearly 44 crore students. I mean, 4.4 crore students and about uh, so many institutions, 60,000 institutions that are there. Of course, colleges don't upload that data. It is university. So maybe it's at least about 1,100 institutions that are uploading that data. So ABC will take time, but that should not be a deterrent because any new such uh, uh, digitization effort does take time to streamline. So happy to see that both the comments so far have been quite uh, positive because uh, yes. uh, it's a question of at least my understanding that faculty are trying to own up the policy to feel invested into trying to implement it. Any other yes. observation, even if it is critical? Yes, Pallavi, please go ahead. That is related to the only online portal like ABC, NAD, and now the... Yeah. Yeah, Dr. I, I got your point. Let Dr. Pallavi speak. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, no, I have heard from uh, some faculties uh, across other campuses also that uh, some criticism coming from NEP for NEP 2020, which I also feel that a lot of criticism comes from the lack of knowledge and understanding of the document itself. And I felt that those who have very extreme views are also the ones who have very limited information about NEP. So what I have felt is in other meetings and some platforms is that NEP will dilute uh, education. That's what one very common thing I've heard across people. So if you can throw some light on that, uh, this is one of the biggest criticism I'm coming across is it will dilute education because I think they are saying it because of the fact that it will provide a lot of flexibility and options for the students. Uh, it is considered as diluting. So I'm not very sure on that point. Um, you're the expert. If you can uh, perhaps help us understand that point better. Because I think it will take some time, a couple of years, and this policy was much needed. Any reform in the education is, is, is very much required for the Indian society, I feel. Yeah, Pallavi, where do you teach and what do you teach, please? Ma uh, so I'm at the NMIMS, uh, uh, this is just across Niti Bai College, the building. Yeah, yeah it's the same uh, management, yeah. So okay. I'm at the Sarla Anil Modi School of Economics. Mm -hmm. I teach advanced micro mathematical methods for economics. And in this semester, I will also teach Indian economy. Okay. So I'm teaching MSc and BSc final year students. Okay, okay. So... Uh, to put the um, uh, so three of you have given your thoughts and you're right to have raised a point of concern that happens to come out very common among the so-called um, uh, I would say opponents of the NEP, which is duly uh, acceptable. Yeah, Sobita, did you want to ask something? Did you unmute to ask something, Sobita? Sobita. Yes, ma'am. You are uh, good afternoon, you ma'am, and uh, good afternoon something. to everyone. Myself, yes, uh, ma'am, myself. Yeah, please, please. Yes, yes, ma'am. Actually, I, I want to share my opinions regarding regarding NEP 2020, ma'am. Uh, myself, uh, Subita Tobiti, speaking from BHB College, Assam. Ma'am, actually, what the thing is that uh, NEP 2020 is very very good and which will which is also going to be more benefit for the students but right now the place where i'm standing it is a rural area uh, rural college and belong belong from rural area ma'am but uh, here uh, students many students are very interested to opt in for the skill course but the main thing is that there is a shortage of teachers and 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 then uh, still now we we are not able to give the skill uh, course to the students so ma'am i just want to know that what will be the solution in the future for those students who wanted to take the skill course that's all ma'am we can up these two together and uh, hello having clubbed up these two uh, uh, sobita please mute, uh, please unmute yourself uh, please mute yourself sobita please mute yourself now Yeah, what I'll do is I'll take up both these questions together and then we can get into the topic. Shabita, please mute yourself. Okay, ma'am.
प्लीज म्यूट योर सेल्फ थैंक यू Uh, uh, Professor Virender, you want to uh, you want to ask the question now, or would it you would like to take it up after? Okay, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Hey, unmute. Please unmute. सबसे पहले सभी को परिणाम और मैम बड़ा अच्छा लग रहा है कि N N E P के बारे में जो इतने भी चीजें पता लगी है लेकिन कुछ चीजें जो मेरे को feel हो रही हैं जैसे रूरल एरिया में रहता हूं मैं और मेरी जो कॉलेज है मैं थोड़ा अपने बारे में बता दूं मेरा नाम वीरेंद्र है सर मैम और मैं असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर हूं ज्योग्राफी का और ज्योग्राफी पढ़ाता हूं और वुमेन कॉलेज में हूं गवर्नमेंट कॉलेज फॉर वुमेन गोहाना गोहाना एक छोटा सा टाउन है छोटा सा और आसपास के जितने रूरल 95% लड़कियां रूरल बैकग्राउंड से आती है हमारे पास तो जो जैसे स्किल इनहांसमेंट के कुछ सब्जेक्ट्स एंड ऐड हुए हैं तो उसके लिए प्रॉपर एक्यूपमेंट और प्रॉपर सेटअप प्रॉपर इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर डेवलप कराना बड़ा जरूरी लग रहा है मेरे को क्योंकि गांव की बच्चियां कहां किस इंडस्ट्री में जाके वोकेशनल करेंगी है ना उनके साथ बड़ी चीजें हैं बड़ी प्रॉब्लम है तो एक जो गवर्नमेंट इंस्टीट्यूट्स है उनका इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर वहां ट्रेनिंग का सेटअप वो मेरे को लगता है उसके बिना तो नहीं हो पाएगा वो एक बड़ा बड़ा मेरे को लगता है वो बड़ी समस्या आपको लग रही है आप बिल्कुल सही कह कह रहे हैं लेट अस ट्राई हम कोशिश करेंगे कि भी जो समस्या है उसकी कुछ हल निकाल सकते हैं या नहीं आपने प्रश्न पूछा तीन प्रश्नों का मैं जवाब देना चाहती हूँ एक तो जो पल्लवी ने कहा कि जनरली एक परसेप्शन देर इज अ परसेप्शन दैट एन ई हैज डाइल्यूटेड एजुकेशन एंड टू क्वेश्चंस रिलेटेड टू स्किल्स द वन इन आसाम एंड द वन दैट वीरेंद्र हैज रेस रिलेट टू हाउ वी कैन इंश्योर दैट वी ऑफर और एक्चुअली इम्प्लीमेंट स्किल एनहेंसमेंट कोर्सेज इन द बेस्ट इफेक्टिव मैनर पॉसिबल now coming to the larger question that pallavi was asking in terms of whether nep has diluted education uh, it arises to a very great extent from the bias that we have because we are all products of a very structured education system which was singular discipline and which talked about disciplinary depth whereas when we talk about giving options you are combining that a student of physics will if they are doing the core discipline of physics will take up a interdisciplinary or a multidisciplinary area which can range from language to a social science subject or maybe a pharmacy subject or an agriculture we've thrown it open so much and we start thinking that that flexibility when you make it available results in dilution so it's a perception that has come about and perception plays a very important part in how we look at it so the perception that we believe that we who did it with specialization like you say i'm teaching uh, e economics or i'm teaching geography or i'm teaching languages this is the perception that i am an expert in that discipline in which i have done my phd or i have done my masters and therefore i have become an expert in that that is because in the 20th century we are all faculty here who had our major part of the education in the 20th century when i say 20th century it sounds as if it's a whole you know long set of years before it is but at the same time knowledge at that time was perceived as being insular by nature insularity of knowledge in the sense that one discipline excludes other disciplines that was seen as exclusion of other disciplines mai hindi mein agar aap batayenge to iska understanding ye hai ki agar aap physics ya economics ya geography pad rahe ho to wo discipline apne aap mein simit thi aur baki discipline se koi connection nahi thi whereas 21st century जब आप ये टर्मिनोलॉजी आप सुन रहे हैं कि कोई भी राष्ट्र में आप सुनेंगे कि वो नॉलेज इकोनॉमी बनना चाहते हैं या नॉलेज सोसाइटी बनना चाहते हैं वो नॉलेज इकोनॉमी और नॉलेज सोसाइटी का कहना ये होता है 
कि नॉलेज डिसिप्लिन इंस्यूलर नहीं है वो अपने आप में सीमित नहीं है वो इंटरकनेक्टेड है बाकी डिसिप्लिनों के साथ में दैट इज द आइडिया ऑफ इंटरग्रेटिंग डिसिप्लिन वेन यू इंटरग्रेट डिसिप्लिन देर इज अ नीड टू हैव मल्टी डिस्पनैरिटी देर इज अ नीड फॉर स्टूडेंट्स नॉट जस्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड इकोनॉमिक्स बट ऑल्सो अंडरस्टैंड मे बी फिजिक्स और ऑल्सो अंडरस्टैंड लॉजिस्टिक्स और ऑल्सो अंडरस्टैंड म्यूजिक और ऑल्सो अंडरस्टैंड डिजाइन थिंकिंग देर नीड्स अ वेराइटी ऑफ एक्सपोजर जो हमारे टाइम में हम ग्रेजुएट थे हम सभी यहाँ पे जो मौजूद है हम आई शेप्ड ग्रेजुएट है जो इंग्लिश शब्द में जो अल्फाबेट आई है वी आर ऑल आई शेप्ड ग्रेजुएट वेर एज आज के दिन में वी रिक्वायर ग्रेजुएट हु आर टी शेप्ड जब आप अल्फाबेट टी देखते हो तो ऊपर की तरफ एक बार है और नीचे की तरफ से भी एक बार नीचे वाली बार जो हम लोग सब है वो डेप्थ है और ऊपर वाली बार जो है दैट इज द ब्रेथ मल्टीपल डिसिप्लिन मल्टीपल स्किल सेट्स मल्टीपल कॉम्पिटेंसीज तो आज के दिन में ये जो एक वहम हुआ है कि एनईपी से डाइल्यूशन हो गई है कम्स फ्रॉम द फैक्ट कि आप बहुत सारे विषयों पे बच्चों को एक्सपोजर दे रहे हैं इससे वो जैक ऑफ ऑल ट्रेड बन जाएंगे और वो एक विषय में एक्सपर्ट नहीं रहेंगे ये गलत फहमी हो गई है क्योंकि तीन ड्राइवर्स ऑफ चेंज हुआ है ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट सेंचुरी में एक की नॉलेज मल्टी डायमेंशनल है दूसरी की लर्निंग मल्टी डायमेंशनल है चार कंपोनेंट्स होते हैं लर्निंग में लर्निंग टू नो लर्निंग टू डू लर्निंग टू लिव टूगेदर एंड लर्निंग टू बी एंड ऑल दीज फोर आर एमेलगमेटेड दे आर नॉट म्यूचुअली एक्सक्लूसिव दे आर ऑल टू बी डन टूगेदर एंड थर्ड ड्राइवर इज द डिसरप्टिव टेक्नोलॉजीज artificial intelligence robotics machine learning challenging the kind of jobs ye teeno changes ke wajah se ye almost imperative hai mandatory hai ki hum flexibility leke aaye agar hum flexibility nahi leke aaye aur hamare chhatron mein aur hamare students mein hum sirf ek hi vishay mein unhe specialized karenge to ye risk rahegi ki wo zyada tar unemployed rahenge या अगर वो एम्प्लॉयड भी रहेंगे या दो तीन साल में वो टेक्नोलॉजी चेंज हो जाएंगी नॉलेज डिसिप्लिन का एम्फोसिस चेंज हो जाएंगी एंड देन दे डोंट हैव दैट डिसिप्लिनरी एक्सपोजर एज अ कॉन्सिक्वेंस ऑफ विच दे बिकम अनएम्प्लॉयड और अनएम्प्लॉयबल टू अवॉइड दैट एनईपी ब्रॉट अबाउट द फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी बिकॉज इट बिलीव दैट द फ्लेक्सिबिलिटी अलाउज फॉर ईच स्टूडेंट टू हैव मल्टीपल पाथवेज and exposure to multiple disciplines multiple skill sets so their knowledge skills capacities and competencies are multiple by nature therefore this perception it is a perception because something that we did not do and which our students have to be taught with is a change in the mindset which is the most difficult thing to actually accept agar aapne alvin toffler ki book padhi hai future shock The, the he defines an illiterate of the 21st century as not one who cannot read or write that is the traditional definition of an illiterate the one who cannot read or write but he defines an illiterate of the 21st century as one who cannot learn unlearn and relearn and if we don't want to be the illiterate of the 21st century we must be able to unlearn the way in which we were teaching or we were being taught and how we want our learners to learn we need to relearn new things so that we are able to provide a relevant higher education to our students so this is one of the reasons why largely a, a, a sizable part of the opponents to nep come about of course needless to say there are other reasons why nep gets opposed that is when people do not differentiate policy with politics uh, pranav bora aapka mute, mic mute kijiye aap thank you so you pranav prasad bora aapka mic mute rakhiye pranav please keep yourself muted i have removed him okay no don't remove him you just mute him it may be a technical issue also doesn't matter but any case ensure that he doesn't unmute uh, needlessly 
So the idea, and there are other reasons why NEP gets opposed when you do not understand, like Pallavi rightly perceived, when they have not understood the policy in its right perspective. And you also unnecessarily mix up politics with policy, which is to be completely different. Because as faculty, we may have many political leanings, but we do not mix that with the policy at all. And it has to be understood in a very dispassionate and objective manner to understand that this reform is necessary to empower our students with the right kind of knowledge, skills, capabilities, and competencies so that they become productive individuals. That is what education is all about. And as faculty, we are the catalyst for that change. Now, though Vishayit Me Upar Jo Virender or Shobita had put up their questions on skill enhancement, when colleges and universities are located in rural areas, there is definitely a challenge in implementing one, whether a college has all the infrastructure or not. And therefore, if infrastructure is not there, where government funding is very limited, that becomes a real, real challenge. But for skill courses, we really are not looking at one size fits all. Jo Assam mein skill based courses honge, wo baut alag hoga Rajasthan se, ya Madhya Pradesh se, ya Maharashtra se, ya Kerala se, ya Telangana se. Har ek jagah ka skill enhancement courses alag 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 areas mein leke a sakte. For example, agar rural area mein hai, to ho sakta hai ki wahan pe cold chain management blockchain management, logistics management, is ki koi zarurat nahi. But Assam jaisa jagah pe, it is possible ki hospitality sector, tourism sector, hotel, um, um, hospital management and um, hotel industry, yaha pe hum focus kar sakte, agribusiness, floriculture, is area me hum focus leke a sakte. Aur bhi agar agar rural areas me jayenge, to agribusiness, Kis tarah se a particular crop ki cultivation from production to marketization, kis tarah se wo value chain leke a jayenge. Is me, aap ka jo ek uh, mansik acceptance hai ki ye industry me jaake unhe kaam karna hai, uski zarurat nahi kyunki India me sabhi jagah pe, hume agricultural log milenge, farmers rehenge, farmer cooperatives rehenge, dairy societies rehti hai, in sabhi se jagah me, Students jaake wahan pe unka internship aur unka hands-on training kar sakte hai. Aur humne ye bhi bataya hai ki jo skill enhancement courses sikhayenge, wo aap aur hum jaise regular UGC approved faculty ne necessarily nahi hona hai, wo, wo faculty ho sakte hai ki jo industry se ya jo bhi wo skill based industry mein available hai, unko expertise ke hisab se contract ke hisab se ad hoc nature mein unhe engage kare so ye jo aapka jo um, uh, mushkil dikh rahe aapko jo ek uh, kami dikh rahi hai institution ke faculty ko agar sikhana hai to wo impossible hoti hai because you don't have faculty who are engaged by UGC as regular assistant professor or associate professor but there are people who are experts and who can be engaged because of their expertise on an ad hoc basis, on a contract basis, on maybe a kind of a fixed thing that this is the number of sessions that you may have to take. You have to tie up with some cooperative society. If it is in an urban area, it can be an industry, but you have to tie up with some other body which is taking care of that skill based course or that skill, whatever skill that we are talking about. Retail management, hai to marketing sector. Mein, yeah, digital marketing hai toh ek, or if it is publishing related to that so this sector mein hai aur ye jo girls ke liye aap bol rahe koi bhi aaj ke din mein aap government mein college mein sikhate ho jahan pe girls jada tar hai but unko bhi koi bhi demarcation hum nahi kare kyunki agar wo agri business ke area mein ja rahe ya digital marketing mein ja rahe they are courses that can be done even in the rural areas. But only difference here hoga ki hum English mein baat kar rahe honge aur wahan pe koi regional language mein baat kar rahe honge. Lekin the basis of that course would remain more or less the same. So, jo skill enhancement ke courses ke liye aap ki jo samasya hai, isko hal karne ke liye aap ek mapping karna padega ki aap ke area mein koon sa skill enhancement courses ideal hai. Wo to curriculum mein leke bhi aana chahiye 
or over and above that you can think of where which are those experts who can come in from the skill based industry who can come in so samasyaye to honge hi lekin hum solutions nikal ke leke aaye jo us situation mein appropriate hai ye bahut zaruri hai so i'm happy that a few of you have raised some very generic and uh, broad based uh, questions on the national education policy i would now urge you all to bear with me to talk about the nash the academic leadership which is the focus of this particular session and why it is important so i'll be talking about why academic leadership and governance is very important as a part of an nep theme why it is important as a faculty for you to understand about academic leadership and a little bit about the governance part of it and the qualities of an academic leader india the uh, indian higher education system is uh, extremely extremely vast and the scale of indian higher education is so vast that we may qualify to become one of the world's largest higher education systems in terms of numbers as per the all india survey for higher education the latest one that is released we have about 1062 universities we have some 47000 affiliated colleges and we have something around 13000 uh, stand alone institutions which are in teacher education management education pharmacy law and so on we have about 4.4 crore students and we are looking at about 16 lakh faculty in higher education massive numbers now the challenge of indian higher education is that the very scale of higher education makes a higher education institution a very complex organization why it is complex because they are not of the same category we have centrally funded institutions like your iits and nits and icers iims the uh, entire central universities that are there or uh, these are all your centrally funded institutions they are governed by the acts of the parliament and statutes that have been brought out then you have the large number of state governed institutions as a subject you know that it is education falls under the concurrent list and state governments also set up their own institutions and a bulk of the institutions and many of you while amu is a centrally funded institution bombay university or pune university all these would be under the state uh, system and these universities all have affiliating colleges and some colleges within that are autonomous some are not autonomous and therefore they are not having degree granting powers then they have the private universities you have private self financing uh, universities also other than deemed universities then amu and others being non affiliating they are basically unitary universe so each character of an hei is different and because each character is different in terms of geographical jurisdiction in terms of the funding source in terms of their jurisdiction in terms of their governance all of it stands out unique and ultimately what is an hei made up it's an it's an intangible entity in a certain sense that when you call it a university it is made up of the students the teachers the administrators the senior management and many other stakeholders who go to make that institution and obviously it is that complexity or where the aspect of leadership comes in so i'm trying to put before you some of the challenges in indian higher education system one is that it is very massive in size it is very complex because it has a number of varieties of institutions and the variety adds to maybe having multiple sets of institution but it adds to the complexities for administration and governance and funding and so on so we would never have and we should not recommend an idea of uniformization but the scale of our higher education system inherently therefore breeds with a lot of challenges that we have to deal with but what is significant is the size of higher education being large needs rationalization and i'll come to that when i talk about how we have thought about it in the nep but more than the rationalization it is the poor quality of higher education 
So quantitatively, we don't have a problem. We have a footprint that is there across the length and breadth. It is there in rural areas, in hilly areas, in so-called geographically inaccessible areas, in island areas. There is a larger concentration, maybe. There is a skewed kind of a distribution of institutions. But the numbers are definitely on our side. The challenge is more in the quality of higher education. And the quality of higher education, we are talking about institutions which are not accredited, which do not participate in the national ranking framework, which are not featuring in even the global rankings. So India, having such a large higher education system, it is extremely painful to note that less than 10 institutions feature in the global rankings, whether they are Times Higher Ranking or QS Rankings or Shanghai Rankings, whatever rankings that are internationally available. These are very few institutions that are there. And there are a handful of them. It's the same set of institutions that gets repeated. Then we say, OK, within 100, we have a few institutions coming. Between 100 to 200, one or two more feature. But in any case, we have not crossed more than 10 in our numbers at all. Even within the national level accrediting and ranking, very few of us are able to really make the mark and in terms of accreditation, it will be shocking to know that if you are looking at 60,000 institutions, with less than 6,000, maybe one-tenth of institutions are actually accredited. The rest of these institutions are not accredited. So the quality of higher education is a big question mark. Now coming to the other aspect is the two major aspects of the disconnect between teaching and research and between education and skills. Now, these two are major aspects relating to the components of education. The current higher education system is not really embedding two functionalities of teaching and research. When you look at higher education, you are talking about three major functions. One is teaching, which is what bulk of us do when we say we are assistant professors and associate professors and professors. And the other is research where you are producing knowledge, new knowledge, knowledge generation and knowledge production. So knowledge dissemination is OK. We are having a large footprint of knowledge dissemination. But knowledge generation and knowledge production, the research output is not as desired. Not even the funding is there and very poor contribution of research articles in peer reviewed journals, development of patents, production of that, all that is just not happening. We, of course, have created the NRF, and we have also introduced the idea of research in undergraduate education. But that is just beginning steps to bridge that gap between teaching and research. In fact, the disconnect, the idea that teaching is purely teaching and it should not include research, has been one of the sort of intrinsic challenges that we are facing in higher education. And that is what we need to set right. And I'll come to that in a short while. The same happens with education and skills. For long, we have perpetrated an education system where we thought higher education deals with only knowledge acquisition and therefore leading to white colored jobs. And that skills or vocational education results in labor productivity, and those are blue colored jobs. And we created a hierarchy thereby where we started looking at this whole notion that we should have more of people going into white collar jobs, not understanding that the entire manufacturing sector, the entire MSME sector, the retail sector, all of it looks for the kind of skills that are needed, which are what we call the vocational courses. So bridging this and not looking at it, looking at it in two different streams, is where the need to embed skills within higher education and not have two different qualifications framework where we have NSQF for the skills framework and the National Higher Education Qualification Framework, which was for a very long time seen as two separate frameworks. But now we have addressed that by trying to merge it together where skills and higher education have also become an intrinsic part of our four-year undergraduate program. So we have sort of, to some extent, 
address that challenge between skills and education. But that still requires a mindset change. It requires a mindset change because parents do not like their students to go in for vocational courses. They feel that that is a labor, whereas the other is a knowledge creation kind, knowledge uh, you have acquired and you go and work in air conditioned offices and corporate houses and business houses and so on. And that productivity part of it is, whereas as a nation, you need to have productivity and you need to have industrial productivity. That's what leads to economic growth and also your generation of the GDP. So if you want to be a three trillion dollar economy, which we hope to become a five trillion dollar economy, you can't do it only if you look at esotericity of higher education. You need to look at higher education in terms of employability, in terms of skills and so on. So that is again another area where we need to look at as a challenge and how we are trying to uh, sort of combine the two together for making it more integrated, integrating skills and making it a part of the higher education system itself. The text dimension is in terms of innovation. And uh, um, before I come to innovation, maybe entrepreneurship. So when you look at the, uh, the whole aspect of higher education, creating jobs and livelihoods and uh, the kind of education and skills that make individuals productive individuals, we are also thinking, can we create people who are not just job seekers, but who are job creators? And therefore, they are needing a lot of exposure for entrepreneurial skills to set up their own startups and so on. So now we look at higher education institutions, not just consisting of having only teaching activities, but having incubation centers, industry academy cells, so that you are actually able to think in terms of having patents and um, having startups and um, uh, ideas which lead to maybe conceptualization of an idea, which then manifests itself as a product and then is go out in the market as a marketable kind of a app or a service or a product that can be used by the industry. And because of the IT influence, the whole sector of creating apps and services have taken a lot of emphasis. And that is one more area where we need to make a number of our students develop their entrepreneurial skills. This is very important because Developing students only for fitting into jobs becomes a very limited scope for higher education. But when you say entrepreneurship, obviously, and when you say research also, you have to have a lot of innovation that comes in. So the you need to break out of the mold and come into accepting new ways in which uh, you have knowledge uh, dissemination and knowledge creation and comes in through a very integrated ecosystem where you find it largely there in IITs and so on. But it's not necessarily that it is confined to only engineering institutions or management institutions. It should be broad based across all disciplines, which is inclusive of our arts, commerce, science colleges and agriculture colleges and pharmacy colleges, law colleges and so on. Of course, the thrust for each of them may be different. So each of these actually in terms of entrepreneurial education, having more innovation, creating more industry academy cells, having this idea of uh, the uh, innovation clubs, clusters, innovation clusters being created. These all are some of the remedies that we are looking at or some of the interventions that we can think of to make higher education more uh, directed towards maybe productivity and so on. Now, on the social side, India is a country which is so diverse in terms of its social fabric with a lot of categories of people who are considered as disadvantaged groups by virtue of gender, by virtue of their caste, by virtue of their community, by virtue of their location. What we wrote in the NEP as the socially and economically disadvantaged groups. So these social and economic disparities has resulted in poor educational participation. And so when you say, for example, that the GER, the national level GER for higher education is 28.4, that is a GER for the entire country as a whole, 
but what is the gr of the scs or the sts or girls and women or minorities or uh, the obcs or children with disabilities or chil chil come children living in tribal areas or in geographically inaccessible areas and so on there is a lot of disparities in the educational participation among these groups and it is in imperative as a part of a sustainable society that we try and bridge these disparities and that is why the nep has made interventions through strategies called of having special education zones the idea of gender inclusion funds the idea that we should have more scholarships that we can offer higher education in regional languages that we provide access devices for children with disabilities these are all a part of interventions to reduce the social and economic disparities resulting in poor educational participation of children from these social groups or poor groups economically poor groups urban poor groups in higher education it is a challenge even in school education but we look at other interventions for school education and we look at more advanced interventions for higher education because while school education might have the, uh, uh, at least children go under the rt act up to the age of 14 but it is where they drop out largely is after their class 10 and their class 12 so you have dropouts happening at class 8 class 10 class 12 and they don't come in obviously into higher education so you mentioned in ensuring that transition rate in school education and those who are coming into higher education ensuring that they are able to come through called for us to make for a very flexible undergraduate program as we have envisaged in that three year four year with a an exit option and the ability to rejoin as a part of the idea of lifelong education the next dimension of challenge that comes in is in terms of not collaborating with other institutions so today in the 21st century individual collaboration and institutional collaboration is the need of the hour and collaboration ac across departments to make multidisciplinarity a reality collaboration across institutions to provide flexibility to our students to take up courses across multiple institutions and collaboration for research with research institutions is equally important so much so that collaboration also needs to go into the internationalization cross-border higher education or internationalization of higher education is today an essential requirement because we look at the globe as a village and we normally say that in india as vasudeva kutumba the idea of the globe being one family so the need for collaborating for joint degrees dual degrees twinning programs and bringing about internationalization and uh, encouraging both student and faculty mobility is also one area that we need to focus upon then poor governance and regulation both internal governance of institutions and external regulation both are wanting internal governance because you should have systematized set of processes and procedures in place which is sort of quite free from external interference and which is uh, like a rule that is applied with standard operating procedures and protocols so if someone is applying for study leave it should not be seen okay it is shakila applying for study leave and shakila is not someone whom i would like to sort of play given a favor to therefore there is nothing like favor or no favor if a rule applies you only go by that protocol does that fit into that requirement it can be for examination it can be for attendance it can be for a scholarship it can be for any aspect but you need to have an institution which has governance through proper rules and regulations and the leadership should be able to be very very dispassionate and objective in the way they look at it this is where the reason why we talk about academic leadership because one of the failings that we have in higher education or the challenges of indian higher education is very poor leadership which is very subjective which is not very transparent there is no sense of fairness and though the rules are there they remain on paper and those are not the ones that are actually applied and that is why in the nep we talked about having very effective internal governing bodies while you have the academic councils you have the board of studies 
you have the finance committee you have the court you have the senate or the executive committee these bodies should be representatives of all cross sections including faculty the students the civil society parents academicians industry scientific community even the local community coming in all these should be a part of that governing bodies of course that is at the higher level where we are talking about an empowered board of governors but when you even come to academic councils the kind of uh, let us say lobbying and the nepotism that comes in with only a few of them being seen as favored and not being allowing other faculty to be a part of it are all counterproductive to having a very poor governance and which will make a lot of disincentivizing and discouragement and it will also affect the low esteem and morale of the faculty because every faculty should feel invested in the institution of which they are a part and if they have to feel in a, in a part of that institution they should be a part of that governing structure and it can happen by rotation you can set up norms so that everyone gets that and not going in as i said by looking at the face of the person these are systematized set of rules and very clear protocols that are being followed and you put that in in place and much on the regulation side which is talking about concentration of power with the regulatory bodies like the ugc and the act and therefore nep talked about a complete revamp of the regulatory system but unfortunately the hecky bill is still in the works it has not yet been introduced in the parliament and till that happens we have the existing regulatory bodies which are having certain limitations because there are combination of functions that are there in one body which leads to concentration of power and which also is conflict of interest with one another the body which is funding is also setting the regulation which is also looking at academic standard setting which is also looking at accreditation and that four functions it's like the legislative the executive and the judiciary cannot be in the same body simple the separation of powers is needed between the functions of accreditation standard setting regulation and funding and that is what the nep had talked about but at the end of all this is this two other factors which are challenges in higher education i talked about the low quality of education and that is actually getting crystallized to poor learning outcomes in higher education the learning outcomes of our higher education students are quite under uh, are quite low in sen in the sense that that piece of paper that we call a degree is really not becoming a very valued paper it is something that does not seem to be relevant in the job market the students are lacking employability skills and many of the students who have acquired that degree are not able to actually translate that when they go into the world of work resulting in the entire business corporate industry sector telling that this higher education degree or the graduate is not having the desired graduate outcomes so looking at learning outcomes of higher education the help needs the entire curriculum to look at learning outcomes based curriculum which is topic based learning outcomes course based learning outcomes and program based learning outcomes the disaggregation of knowledge understanding skills and competencies and having faculty looking at a lecture or a topic to be taught from outcome based education and its approach for outcome based education where testing is not memory or rote testing but you are testing analytical skills the problem solving skills the ability of collaborative skills looking at students having let us say cognitive thinking scientific temper rational thought independent thinking this is what needs to be nurtured as what we call as the 21st century skills or the higher order thinking skills so what is right now happening is you are teaching something because you know that topic and whatever resides in you as knowledge is passed on to the student without saying i taught the subject had the learner learned that subject no way that we are assessing that so there is a huge gap between what is taught and what is learned and that is sought to be bridged through an outcome based approach which means that a faculty prepares a lesson plan if it is a one hour lecture 
what is that knowledge that the learner acquires what is the understanding what is the skills what are the competencies what are the activities that i engage the learner with where i'm not going to test the memory but i'm actually trying to analyze whether the student has really understood that topic and is able to use that in solving a problem or in a, a sort of applying that theory into a real life situation which means you use discussions group discussions oral presentations quizzes field surveys studio activities lab related work many of these kind of teaching tools are complete shift in the pedagogy so that you move towards outcome based education and the the person who is hanged or crucified by the entire administration and the government is none other than the teacher and i know that as a teacher who happened to be in the government the first thing that they would say is we have very poor quality faculty and the teachers are here only to get their salary and not to teach and i know how we have i have tried to defend the cause of teachers mentioning that the quality of faculty the criticality of it is very important but faculty also need to be enabled in terms of being provided a lot of enablers good working conditions good service conditions possibilities for promotion and career growth capacity building and continuous professional development so while it is very easy to finally flack the teacher for the entire poor learning outcomes the poor quality of education poor research lack of innovation for everything the person you hang by the neck is the teacher the important part is whether the system recognize the criticality of the faculty and that is what precisely the nep has tried to do by trying to say that you need to provide for the professional development of faculty through continuous training and retraining and allow leadership which will le uh, sort of provide leave sabbaticals to allow participants see right now what's happening is everything is happening online and therefore there is not much in terms of duty leave and things that come in but otherwise many of the institutions to for very valid reasons sometimes it is very severe faculty shortages you know that we have almost about 40 to 50% of faculty positions which are vacant so every department is having a challenge and when you spare a faculty for maybe a two weeks program is a huge pressure on the other departmental colleague sometimes it's only a one man department and therefore one is not able to do that so it can happen only during the summer vacations or the winter vacations and so on so that is a a, a real challenge but the need to recognize that they should allow for participating in such kind of conferences seminars workshops orientation programs refresher programs and it is not a one time affair that it is a continuous professional development how to use blended modes of learning how to look at more innovative ways of assessment how do we look at more innovative pedagogical techniques these all require training and retraining so the poor quality of faculty while it is definitely a challenge emanates from the fact that there is not much serious consideration being given for their capacity building and for their professionalization and for their continuous professional development along with that is the need that we are talking this topic itself which is to say that leadership development is a part of the faculty training and that we understand that all academic institutions will have positions like a dean or an hod of a department or a director or a vice chancellor or a pro vice chancellor or all these positions must actually be held by people who are faculty who move up the academic career path to take up these leadership positions and that is something that is an incentivization so leadership development happens at initial stages for young faculty happens for the mid level faculty and also happens for the senior faculty shakir had read about saying that i was a part of a training program where we talked about leap leap was nothing but leadership for academicians program under which we trained about nearly 600 faculty who are at the level of associate professors and professors for taking up leadership positions i mean initially we took at only the professors who had 10 years experience but we also later on came down and climbed down to the idea of associate professors but we had kelam and amu is a center for 
uh, academic leadership and educational management, where we were training faculty who are at the level of assistant professors and associate professors for leadership development. So this is the value chain that we look at in terms of addressing that problem. But there is one more small issue on which I'll touch as the need for using or integrating technology for our educational institutions. Technology needs to be integrated for teaching learning, for enriched teaching learning experiences. And we need to have blended models of teaching and learning, not just using a chalk and a talk, but using many other tools at the absolutely rudimentary and the basic level is a PowerPoint. The, but many other ways of using videos, quizzes, Google uh, as a platform or any other. I'm not trying to market Google, but any other platform. And to be also familiar with the new emerging things like chat GPT and so on. Let us understand our students use it at a very adept level. So the need to use integrate technology for wider reach, for a more enriching experience, for actually relating it to better learning because it provides for enriched packages within a learning experience. So let us say you're looking at even for skills for that matter. A small video which tells you how a particular product is actually manufactured. When you show it to the student, that student understands it much better. So using all these, using educational videos, using live streaming of something that is happening, these are all to be incorporated to make a very enriching learning experience. So these are challenges. NEP provides some solutions in trying to say, for better governance, we can have a board of governors. We will create an institutional development plan, which is like a strategic plan of action and so on. But let me now come to the idea of what are the qualities that we look at when we are talking about an effective academic leadership. So when we say that a leader should be a good academic leader, there are some 10 qualities that we want that leader to acquire and to be uh, sort of uh, an expert and develop skills in that particular area. And the first and the foremost is visioning and strategizing. All your educational institutions open the website. You will find a vision document, a, missions, a vision statement, a mission statement, and a set of goals and objectives. A, a person who is an educational leader or an academic leader, whether it is at the level of an HOD or a dean or a director or at a much higher level at becoming the vice chancellor, must always have visioning and strategizing. What is the vision that we want to see my college or my university or my institute achieve? And that cannot be frozen in point of time. This is precisely where the mistake is happening. We have somehow thought that we made some vision statement some 50 years back and we that is remaining there as being our vision statement so many changes have happened and the nep itself looks at completely revamping and transforming education should we not therefore revisit the vision doc, vision statement the mission statement and the goals and objectives so it, a leader has to be a first and foremost having this ability of visioning and strategizing and looking at a trajectory or a future plan, which is for five years, which can be short term, for 10 years, which can be midterm, and which is long term, maybe for 15 years or 20 years. And this should be a dynamic process, not by that leader alone, but by the collective efforts of all the stakeholders, which includes the faculty, young faculty, senior faculty, parents, students, representatives, the so members from the civic community, industry, all of them have to be a part of this exercise. So that is the first quality that we look at. Once a faculty goes on to become an academic leader in whatever position, I'm not repeating it, it can be an HOD or a dean or a director or a vice chancellor, whatever level, one must be very good at administrative management. Because when you're a faculty, you are only looking at the discipline that you teach. But moment you assume a leadership position, it is an administrative role and you are an academic administrator. And therefore, you should be quite thorough 
about rules and regulations and statutes and all those aspects. You may not necessarily know it to the hilt, but you should be at least broadly able to understand what are the rules. And ignorance cannot be said that, no, no, I am a faculty. I teach chemistry. What should I know about how administration is all about? No way. Moment you assume that administrative position, and which is not going to come from outside, you must be able to shoulder and mantle that responsibility. You must make yourself thorough about administrative management. Then comes the financial management. Whenever you become an HOD, it's a question of allocating funds, allocating resources, sending that how much can be spent for an exhibition, how much can be spent for an activity, how much can be spent for a sports event. These all may come into the play. And also in terms of the resources, lab resources, library books, the ICT resources, for that funding that is required. So you must be thorough in terms of financial management. Obviously, the higher you go at the level of being the director of an institute or a vice chancellor, there will be much larger macro level pictures for which, of course, there's a finance committee. But you can't remain ignorant and say that that is not my business at all. And that's not something I try to get myself empowered about. One has to learn and empower themselves by knowing about financial management. Now, coming to the core aspect of a higher education, it deals with students, it deals with teachers, and it deals with the institution itself and teaching learning. So coming to teaching learning, uh, in any higher education institution, must the leader must be able to think, how do I improve the quality of my teaching and learning in my institution? How do I look at whether my institution can go in for accreditation, participate in some rankings, participate in state level rankings, national level rankings? How do I put all those necessary things to improve the quality of teaching and learning by having the kind of infrastructure, the library resources, the staff necessary, the technical staff necessary, the entire gamut, including in that of research and innovation. You either can put it within teaching and learning or you keep it separately. But research and innovation also impacts the quality of education. So on quality, the leader has to be very clear. How do I propose to enhance the teaching learning quality? How do I propose to enhance the research output and the innovation contribution? So these two aspects are equally critical, requiring a lot of brainstorming, sitting down with people, talking about it, working out strategies, keeping timelines, what does it to be achieved? If faculty is not there, how do we uh, uh, recruit more faculty as per the norms? If infrastructure is not there, if teaching learning resources are not there, what are those inputs that are necessary? In addition to the inputs, how do we enhance the outputs and the outcomes that need to come? So teaching and learning, research and innovation. Coming to students, student support services. And when I say student support services, it is academic support, the socio-emotional support that we need to give. So the learner support is a very important part of an administrative, of a kind of a leadership quality that leaders must. They can't be insensitive to the needs of the learners. They can have, students would always have a number of demands. The basic things have to be there in place. But they should also have methods by looking at areas which need support. It can be academic support. It can be career guidance. It can be socio-emotional support, psychological support in terms of counseling. All these have to be provided, including for educational delivery and transaction. Whatever academic learning support has to be provided, the leader needs to envisage and try to address that on a regular, continuous basis. And that is not putting a set of rules over there. Now comes the next question when you deal with student is dealing with student diversity. When you look at inclusion and the point that I told you as a challenge that there are a lot of social disparities and economic disparities, you need to provide and look at student diversity. Our classrooms are very heterogeneous uh, places. They are heterogeneous because you have girls, you have first generation learners, your people coming from regional background, from rural areas, you need to look at it as not being one monolith, but each one of them having to be addressed. The looking at student diversity is looking at student inclusion and addressing a lot of student grievances, which results 
and prevents maybe a lot of aberrations like students taking away their lives or having a lot of rioting that happens on the campuses. These all are issues related to student diversity. Now coming to the teacher, looking at the aspects relating to faculty growth and development. The teaching learning can improve. Students can be happy only if the faculty are empowered. And looking at all the necessary requirements for faculty, as I said at the beginning, providing leave, providing good working conditions, providing for them the reading resources and the other resources so that they are enabled to use that, including participation in capacity building and so on, and their professional development. All this, including faculty mobility for international participation, these are all part of the faculty uh, enhancement that we are looking at. And this is another quality that a leader needs to nurture. In the context of technology, we need to think in terms of how institutions can leverage all sorts of ICT and digital resources for looking at more hybrid models and blended models of teaching. So technology and its integration, not only for teaching learning, but in terms of data management, in terms of processes for admissions and examinations and internal assessments and formative assessments and so on. How do we ensure that technology is integrated and you have effective e-learning platforms where you are today able to do online teaching and so on? These needs to be taken care of. And the last aspect is of internationalization. So today you need to have an academic leader who is very seized of the fact that collaboration is integral it can be a collaboration at a local level. It can be a collaboration at a state level. But it can go beyond that to talk about joint degrees and dual degrees. And therefore, the need to have international students' offices created on university campuses. Usually, colleges may not have that. But wherever colleges attract a lot of foreign students, we may have to think in terms of a one-stop window where you can address many needs of the uh, of the students coming in from other nations. India is a country where 7.5 million students go out every year. And a minuscule 40,000 students come into India. I'm talking about India as a whole. This is the, uh, the nature of the mobility. The outward mobility is so massive. And it is increasing manifold every year. And the inward mobility of our students is absolutely at a very, very low level. And even if you're targeting the Asian continent or the Middle East area or the African countries or even the Latin American, we are only getting to people from our South nations, which is the immediate neighbors in Bhutan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and so on, or Sri Lanka and so on. These are the only nations who are coming to us. We are not getting students from the uh, regions, we think, where we are much more educationally equipped, but we are not getting. But our students are going in hordes to US or Australia or Canada or UK, um, uh, many other countries, New Zealand, all these countries, you are seeing students going out in hordes. So this balance has to be done. And an academic leader cannot say it is somebody else's problem. He has to think in my institution, can I attract foreign students to come into my, what are the kind of courses that can be attractive to them? So this whole idea of talking at the leadership qualities and for governance, we have set an instrumentality called an institutional development plan, which is nothing but a strategic plan of action, which every college and every university needs to build upon. So even you can carry back that message to the colleges to which you belong, that we must prepare an institutional development plan. Because first and foremost, it does a SWOT analysis. What are my institution's strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats or challenges? That itself gives you a reviewing mechanism to understand where are the shortcomings. Is the infrastructure short? Is the faculty in a shortage? Are we having some teaching learning resources in shortage? Getting all this together and then working out what do I want? And that is related to that first quality of an academic leader of visioning and strategizing. And an IDP is not made by a bureaucrat or not made by a politician or not made by an outsourced agency. It is made by a task force that is within the institution itself, which include faculty representatives, a few student representatives, industry, scientific community, the, the local um, parents. These are the ones who should be part of that exercise. And it's a dynamic living document 
which will have timelines, which will have targets, which will have some key performance indicators. And this would actually help our higher education institution to become very effective higher education institution. Because you have a goal, you have a target. It can be a quality target. It can be a quantitative target. And you look at several measures how to reach that goal or how to reach that target. So as faculty, you need not think and say, I'm only an assistant professor. What have I got to do with that? Please read through the UGC guidelines. You should also be proactive to see that you also become part of such exercises which happen in your institution. And if they're not doing it, the fact that you attend programs of this kind carry forward that message that these are very, very critical to making higher education institutions effective institutions so that we have empowered students, we have empowered faculty. And when you have both empowered students and faculty, you will have empowered higher education institution. So the quality of a higher education institution to a great extent de depends upon having very effective leadership who are democratic, who listen to faculty, who receive thoughts, and who are open-ended about being open to reform and changes. So I'll stop here. We have some about seven minutes for interaction. And I would be happy to take up some more feedback and questions from your side. Thank you. Participants, if you have any observation, any question, you can raise your hand. Yes, Pallavi, please go ahead. Thank you for the presentation, ma'am. Uh, no questions, uh, but it was a great presentation. I heard uh, a lot of what you said. You spoke very well, ma'am. I'm happy actually to join this program because uh, more than just you, you've emphasized many times to read the document. Uh, but I think by participating in such a program uh, and hearing from speakers like you and previously also yesterday, I think it's, it's a great learning because uh, we've come to know more about NEP through your sessions and uh, from speaker sessions than through just reading. Uh, because I, I listen to you and then I see that how much of what you said is, is actually being adopted by my institution. And I also think that it's I'm fortunate enough to have the infrastructure in place at NMIMS to take ahead the policy uh, by the NEP. Whereas I think because in, in our group only, there are several faculties who are from rural areas and who do not have the infrastructure to support the, uh, the policies and the ideas that NEP is coming up with. So I feel uh, it's just by luck uh, and uh, it's just by luck and by chance. And I'm fortunate to be part of an institution where I see everything which you spoke and which is mentioned in the NEP document being actually followed and implemented by our institution. So we've done so many things, vision, uh, student feedback, appraisal, uh, so many aspects of what you spoke about NEP skill development. In fact, um, uh, starting from student orientation to making sure that they go for internships every semester to being able to place them and teaching them skills such as R and and data science and making part of it, making part of, you know, making technology part of what we teach. So I, my only observation is that I think I'm the one, I'm, I'm perhaps fortunate to have infrastructure at my institute, but if for equality's sake, if the government can provide infrastructure to rural areas to implement this NEP, it would be great, ma'am. What are your views on this, ma'am? No, there are there are a lot of uh, unevenness in the way there is access to resources, infrastructural resources. 
and india is a very resource starved uh, nation and very few institutions are actually having everything in place but even so as someone who's been a part of doing the exercise of education planning right from 2004 5 onwards i would say that for the rural areas and for the less uh, advantageous areas within the limitations that they have there are many things that we can still achieve and this assumption that uh, because we have all the infrastructure it is easier to do it if the mindset is not there that would still not be possible but where you have for example virinder or you have the person from assam talking with the limited infrastructure it is still doable but only thing is it is not maybe on a scale that is done in an urban area so you need to focus on those kind of skill sets and those sort of resources uh, that is available in that area let us understand the paucity of infrastructural financial and human resources is a reality in not only urban areas and rural areas becomes more accentuated in island areas in hilly areas in tribal areas in so-called aspirational districts which are left-wing extremist affected areas and so on but for each of these places we believe in one thing it's not a one size fits all and that within an institution with the limitations that they have they can still work out solutions so all your frugal innovations that you talk about is possible in many ways even in rural areas like i said if you're talking about assam or you're talking about a very remote area where virender is teaching what are those kind of courses whether it's home science courses whether it's nutrition related courses whether even for internship can they study a midday meal scheme that is operating there or can they study a scheme that anganwadis are looking at anganwadis are there all over primary health centers are there all over so internships are possible there also but you might have to deal with languages we have said higher education can be offered in regional languages so let them do it in regional languages and provide ability enhancement courses for communicative english so the the fact that we are in urban settings definitely is an advantage but those who are in rural areas need not feel dissolution because you can always find very localized solutions to deal with such obviously the the uh, the challenge becomes more but it is not that they are not available and that solutions cannot be found out so that is how i look at it as a planner myself and we've dealt with it because when we study a state plan we study all aspects of it not just the education we see education health electricity water sanitation roads uh, all sorts of things and they are all seen in a very integrated manner and the fact remains that our departments in the state level do not collaborate with other departments so you need to think in terms of the education sector looking at industry department how can industry come in how can other local resources come in that can come in through agriculture department that can come in through rural development department we need not look at education as i said for multidisciplinarity just as our disciplines are not insular departments also need not be insular so you look at all these in a very collaborative manner and there are solutions that are possible because these days we look at integrated planning and not just education planning in isolation to others the question is how to talk to them and you want people in the institution that is where that leadership comes in as a as a young faculty i'm an assistant professor you are having a skill pro education problem you go to the rural development department you go to the agriculture department you deal with maybe the uh, women and child department there talk to those people you will get people who can come in to take up your skill enhancement course that is the way to go about not saying that we are here nothing is possible that is the way i have given you some ideas and also read through the ugc's guidelines for skill enhancement courses coming in for internships and so on there are a number of ideas that you can leverage in your localized context. Any other uh, participant? Pallavi Gupta, if you, you have raised your hand, but yes, I, I, I just uh, want to add to. I want to thank oh. Ma'am for the good session. Just one more doubt I have is that initially if you can throw some light on this doubt i have is that initially in the first few years 
of implementation of NEP, don't you think that, like I said before, the institutions which have the ability to provide infrastructure, because also, see, honestly, I tell you, uh, an institution like ours charges a lot of fee from the students. So we are able to support, create an infrastructure for them. We have a world-class library. We have, we have all facilities. We have AC running 24-7. And we charge a lot of money from the students. And then on that basis, when we are able to provide these facilities, ma'am, to the students, the reputation of our institution increases because we are the ones which are able to implement NEP. But don't you think with this NEP 2020, because of the fact that we, for example, if some institutions are already leveraged, don't you think they will have additional advantage and this will create gaps? between those institutions which did not have that leverage and as compared to those which had the advantage because okay. the ones which had advantage will implement NEP faster they'll increase the accreditation they'll get a rankings uh, and those who are falling short will fall short more so the gap do do you think in the first few years of NEP the gap will sort of increase between the ones which are privileged and between the ones which are not privileged. I, this was just one last question I have. Affordability of higher education is a major concern. And we are very conscious of the fact that there are institutions like yours which charge exorbitant fees and only the affordable can take. But when you look at su su sustainability, you need to think in terms of affordability for making education available to one and all. But the fact that NEP has come doesn't heighten that. It is only that whether it was NEP or not, despite NEP or not, affordability and high fee structures of some of the institutions was always there. But that does not mean we cannot ask the private sector to invest into that. That is something that if it is coming forth, coming. High fees is that if you look at IIMs now. No, no, no. But let me, we don't have time for a detailed discussion. There's another yes. session due at 530. Let me just respond to your question. The point yes. relates to the fact that we should be conscious of the high social and economic disparities that exist. And I do not believe that a student who comes out of an AC classroom performs any bit much better than a person who is coming out from a rural background who does not have a bench to sit. That is, there is no evidence which tells us that. It's only that the living standards or the conditions for learning, uh, those are not the conditions for learning. And to be very, very frank, there is, there is absolutely no evidence to tell us that the so-called high-ranking institutions with very high fees, the learning outcomes of all the students. You might come into the rankings, you might have the accreditation. But that's beside the point. The point is that all institutions have to find ways and means by where there is effective learning happening. And the index for that measurement is not whether there is all the infrastructure. There are, as I said, limited infrastructure. And despite the NEP, NEP is not a tool or a reason for widening that gap that gap exists whether NEP was there or not there itself and that was even at the time there are faculty shortages then and now lack of infrastructure lack of teaching learning resources lack of ICT these are all there whatever add-ons are there can always be there because of the resources but that does not mean that a college in a remote part of India is not able to have people who come out with effective performances. I think that that distinction must be removed from our mind that all institutions which are well placed infrastructurally and financially come out with better learning outcomes. They may get the branding. Branding is a marketable product. And marketing education as a product is something that is an inevitable part of, a, a, a I would say, a kind of an economy that moves in that direction. But at the same time, sustainability and inclusion calls for looking at massifying higher education so that even the last student in the last mile is getting that opportunity to participate. And that's the way you look at planning in a very macro level thinking rather than saying that I would try to provide all infrastructure. India does not have that resources. And with that limitation, how do we provide for a sustainable education system? is what we need to look at. So those challenges, despite NEP is not a reason for that widening, the transition takes time. And many of the institutions are doing their best within the limitations that they have to really come about. So I think I'll have to stop here because 
Dr. Shakir will tell me that there is another session at uh, 5.30 and I should not be infringing upon that session. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, for delivering such a wonderful session. As usual, your sessions are very wonderful. Nation, uh, and ma'am, you can see the messages of the participants. Thank you once again for coming here and for and for delivering such a nice session, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much to all of you, and wish you all all the very best. Thank and you, always thank remain you so proactive, and always never feel bogged down by the challenges that you face. There are always solutions to everything. You need to live and work around the problems. Problems never go away. They are a part and parcel of our life, personal and professional. So therefore, just live around that and not run away from it. All the very best. Uh, participants, uh, next session will be of Professor Masroor Alam Saab. And uh, we have just uh, five minutes are left. So you can uh, join that session after just after two or three minutes because uh, yes, the resource, resource person has sent me the message that he's, uh, he will be joining us after just after four minutes. Okay, participants, I'm ending this session. Please join by the next new link.
हेलो पार्टिसिपेंट्स एम आई ऑडिबल पार्टिसिपेंट्स हेलो यस सर यस सर कंचन मैम यस सर एम आई ऑडिबल यस सर ओके हाउ वाज द लास्ट सेशन इट्स गुड सर वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव madam came from directly from the nep background she was the osd of nep 